Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare 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 Krishna Mahadeva, Anjamukha, 
Chakamukhe Krishna Krishna Hare Hare Mahadeva Panchamukhe Rama Rama Hare Hare Amahole Chakamukhe Krishna Krishna Mahadeva Anjamukhe Rama Rama Hare Hare Prabhupada Ki Jai Shri Bonitai Ki Jai Adinam Sankirtan Ki Sri Hatmadanga Ki Sri Varakri Mahamuhutsav Ki Jai Go Pray Manali Hare Krishna, the Mount Vishnu, but I have Krishna, but I have but lay. She might have up to the Dante Shom, which you know, may I must taste as what you do. Go to Vani, which I may have said, so sing the Mighty Pastor Charlie sing. That's one song, Prophet, let us sing. He said it was fine to sing it, funny enough. Lauder, Lord Brahma with his four mouths is chanting Krishna, Krishna, and Lord Pan, Lord Shiva, my day with five mouths, work that one out, is chanting Rama, Rama. Well, they're together, they're combined, chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Ram. So today, not that we need to, not that Prabhupada did, not that we have to, but there's a very nice section in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which I thought we would focus in on. There are many sections in Srimad Bhagavatam dealing with Lord Shiva's relationship with Krishna, and etc. And so many beautiful prayers of Lord Shiva. His interactions with um, Daksha and many other places in the Bhagavatam where Lord Shiva is present, where he gives his association. Um, but today I thought we would read from the eighth canto. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 So, if you want to follow, I don't know, there's nothing on the board, of course, because this verse is out of order. Um, but we're not really reading a verse specifically, although we will be focusing on one verse. We're going to be reading a series of verses which will culminate perhaps in one particular verse, but not exclusively. So this is the 8th canto, chapter 7. Rishikesh Prabhu is here. You haven't got the book today? You haven't got a book? Okay. Yesterday he pulled out the same book that I was using yesterday. It was quite amazing. Um, so 8th Canto chapter 7, and I don't know where we'll start, maybe we may start on text 36, I think. This chapter is called Lord Shiva Saved the Universe. Um, and you may be aware that this is uh, the instant of the churning of the milk ocean. And the demigods and demons, they're hoping to get nectar, immortality, etc. From this recommended activity. They recommended the demon that the demigods were recommended to hold truce with the demi with the demons and to mm, churn the milk ocean. So long story. Um, but the update on this story is that um, they're churning away. All kinds of poison comes out. <coughs> it's a bit scary. You may have noticed that sometimes when you churn. Um, of course, you could use the example of butter or yogurt or something, or churning, things come to the surface also. But, uh, let's give an example of our own endeavors to um, practice Krishna consciousness when... Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, brother. Cup of chai. Chai. Where's the biscuits? 
tea, tea time. <laughs> English, no, we can't have tea without biscuits. <laughs> you haven't met an English man that doesn't, that takes tea without biscuits. <laughs> anyway, I've got something in my mouth to try to, try to pacify the throat a little bit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, what to do? All this poison's coming to the surface. So, when we chant Hare Krishna, sometimes you may notice it's a kind of a churning, the ocean of our consciousness, and sometimes dirty things come up, don't they? Maybe, maybe it's only me. I don't know. <laughs> Got a lot of churning to do. Um, but sometimes, maybe all kinds of things come up. Some dirty, some not so dirty, some devious disturbances, all kinds of things come up in the ocean of our consciousness as we churn when we chant Hare Krishna. So similar corollary here that they're churning the milk ocean and the poison at this point of time, poison is coming up, other things will come up, but at this point of time the poison has come up. And sometimes it's the poison which has to come out first, huh? and then the good things can come. There was a lot of poison when Kali was being smashed to bits by that Krishna dancing on his head, hoods, all the poison is coming up huh? and it comes out. So uh, many different examples could be there, but this is what happens in devotional service, poison comes out. So let, what are we going to do about it? So the demigods in their case, they were really struggling and suffering. They went to Lord Shiva. Um, who wasn't directly participating, apparently. He was on the Kailash mountain, and they appealed to him to please. They praised him, and sometimes you praise people, either unknowingly or beyond the actual, let's say, level of eligibility, but for various reasons. So they had a specific reason. They were hoping that Lord Shiva would save them. They, they, they were approaching him in general. Lord Shiva's lead head of the demigods in, in reality. And, and he's also, in many ways, acting in the role of Lord Vishnu in the creation of the universe and so many things. He basically takes on, empowered by the Lord, of course, but he um, plays the part of the Supreme Lord. There are many occasions like this where even Krishna sometimes goes to Lord Shiva to... Um, <coughs> To alleviate a situation like this one, he himself was there. Vishnu was there. He could have easily alleviated it, but he didn't. Um, he, along with the demigods, they went to Lord Shiva. Um, because Lord, Lord, of course, Lord Shiva is not an ordinary entity by any means. But, um, to the Lord, the Lord loves to give the credit to his devotees, or even his expansions in this case. Um, and show proper respect. Lord Shiva is not, not just a, an empowered incarnation or a particular expansion of the Lord. Shiva Shakti um, has a major role in creativity and destruction of the universe. He doesn't generally maintain, but here they're asking him to help maintain the universe. And it's the will of the Lord, so this is the next scene will come in. There's also a great Vaishnava, as we all know, Vaishnava and Tatar Shambhu, that sometimes is said to be the greatest Vaishnava. Because we hear different things in different relationships that so and so is the greatest Vaishnava. But in the universe, in one sense, and when we talk the universe in general, not specifically, particularly devotees who are worshipping the Lord in pure devotional service, but in general, Lord Shiva will be seen universally as the greatest Vaishnava. Many people worship him independently of Vishnu. And usually I was reading this morning, Prabhupada was discussing with one famous man, a big man, Chennai, who was very much a Shaivite. And this man was really strong. He was God, not Vishnu. And he wanted to talk to Prabhupada about it. Probably can go there. He just said, generally speaking, when people approach the deity, he didn't even say which deity. He said that they... They ask for material things, liberation or material things. Vaishnavas, those who worship Lord Vishnu, they don't generally ask for that. And they kind of kept it at that. 
again with that role, Lord Shiva's role, for those who are materially inclined is probably the most powerful, or his expansions, Murgam Kadikeya, his um, consort Uma, Parvati, Setra Sati, different names she goes by, and Durga, uh, she's the consort of Lord Shiva, Amun, Mariamun. She's the consort of Lord Shiva, so naturally people who are encased in this material world who are basically don't know what's beyond it are going to approach the immediate seeming power. Lord Shiva and his consort, so Lord Vishnu also is, in a sense, is almost. Um, coming there and the demigods are praying to Lord Shiva, you are the super soul, you are the source of everything, you are the supreme Brahman, saying all sorts of things. For whatever reason, he is an expansion of God in, in a different way, energetic, potent, whatever, expansion for particular purposes. So in one sense he is, in another sense his Baba gives the example of milk and, and yogurt. A yogurt is, in one sense, it's milk, but it's not milk also. It can't act as milk. Everybody knows that. It's sour. And if you use it in place of milk, you're not going to get the same result. You try to cook sweet rice with yogurt. <laughs> there might be some other preparation, but it's not going to be sweet rice. So it has a different propensity. But it's nonetheless, it's coming from milk. Lord Shiva comes from Vishnu. But he can't act as Vishnu, exactly. Although sometimes he's recognized like that because he's, um, he's a particular expansion of the Lord so for a particular reason. So anyway, aside from all of this and the creativity of the universe, the, the glance of Lord Vishnu and where Shiva appears in that sense to impregnate the universe, which is none other than you could say his own consort. Um, in that sense, as a man impregnates a woman to create offspring. Um, Lord Shiva has his role also, but mainly he's understood to have the role of uh, a more overseeing Tamagun and uh, this, the destruction or this, the, the final um, wind up of the universe. Um, mainly, that's his usual role in the triad. Um, but he's got many other parts and, and he loves to uh, he loves also to actually play the part of Vaishnava in terms of you know, reality, as so to speak, preaching. Just like in his song, there's a song of Lord Shiva, beautiful songs are there, I think, in the fourth canto, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I think it's the fourth canto, songs of Lord Shiva, um, sometimes known as Rudra Gita. And uh, there was beautiful prayers, which are very powerful prayers. Gave probably to the Pachetas, I think, to the Pachetas, who perform in austerities. So he's Vaishnava and he loves to take that role. We see in our own um, devotional lives, Lord Shiva plays a very significant role. Um, if ever you go to Vrindavan, um, Lord Shiva has specific roles there. What, is it, what role does he take? Can you think of one? He protects the Dham. He's a Dikbal, he's the protector of the Dham there four specific deities of Lord Shiva protecting the different directions of Vrindavan Dham. Um, and um, other ways he's appearing in Gaur Lila, Lord Veta Charya. He appears in Gaur Lila. He appears in different ways, but in that particular combined as a combined form of Shiva and Vishnu but as Lord Veta Charya. Um, he's also very influential in helping us to become free of the false ego, since in one sense he's the origin of that, in a sense, not originally everything is origin in Krishna, but he plays that role in this material world, his, uh, his consort, of course, to cover us, impregnating us into this material world. It's Vishnu who does it, but he assists in that particular act, and, and uh, into his consorts, uh, say the womb of the universe, Maya Devi. Durga Devi, and uh, so that's the false ego of identifying with this world, and one may, one may, I would never recommend it, I don't think anyway, 
but one may understand that and see that Lord Shiva can help us to become freed of the false egotistical um, illusion that we're in. We play, he can play that role too. So sometimes the boys, they approach Lord Shiva, even the demigods, other demigods, less powerful ones even, and pray for pure devotional service. Because Lord Shiva is the greatest devotee in this regard, in relation with the material universe. Um, we may pray to him for pure devotional service, which is very rarely obtained. But by the mercy of great souls like Lord Shiva, we may attain it. So his real feelings is in this, in relation to this past time of churning of the milk ocean and his saving the universe. He wants to save the living entities. He feels compassion, very compassionate. Lord Shiva's position entails he has to act in such and such a way, I could say, but he's actually very compassionate. He's most auspicious when the word Shiva means. What does it mean? Pardon? <coughs> yeah, very auspicious. Hmm. <coughs> it's no caffeine, don't worry. <laughs> we, somebody wrote me an email, and I mean, many, I, I, please don't do this. They put it on a forum, you know, and many of the doors on the forum were kind of innocent. They said, latest GBC resolution, caffeine is allowed in ESCOM. <laughs> it was a joke, you know, I don't know if someone said it. I mean, there are devotees who think there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and may have some medicinal reasons, I don't know. But it was, you know, but a lot of the innocent doors thought it was serious. But they don't know nothing, you know. Said, Please don't put this on a forum like this. It's, it's, uh, you know, we have to now we have to unexplain what, you, <laughs> what you've done. You know. But this, believe me, I, I well, I, I don't know. Maybe where's Rusty Kanda? Is he here? Yeah. Caffeine free? I think so. I think so. <laughs> That didn't sound very confirmative. <laughs> I'll be on. Okay, yeah, up again on the next campaign. <laughs> Guru Sanyasi is taking caffeine. <laughs> Chocolate caffeine, this thing, that thing. My goodness. What will be next? So, where were we? Not she go auspicious? Auspicious. Very auspicious. So Shiva Ratri, yes, today is festival, right? Ratri means? Ratri means? Night. 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 In one sense we say most auspicious night, the night of Lord Shiva is when today, or tonight, especially in the evening, um, Shiva Ratri, the night. What happens on Shiva Ratri? What's the history? Get married. Oh, well done. I mean, you can't really say, the day Lord Shiva appeared. How have you worked that one out? <laughs> <laughs> there's some such analysis, but there's a day when he, uh, I don't know what say, he's eternal consort, but the actual event is honored and celebrated this day when he, he gets married to Parvati. Oh, whatever form. So, and that's one of the angles for the devotees. Of course, this is not a major aspect, you could say, of our general, not mentioned much anyway, our general Vaishnava life, but it is mentioned. It's even on our calendar now, although I don't think it used to be, but it's there now, and certainly Lord Shiva comes up again and again in our Shastras, very important role to play in Lord, the Lord's mission, um, even in the Sankirtan mission. Um, so here's one of the, I was going to read some verses now, in the eighth canto. I'll just read the English until we get to a specific verse. Sri Sukadeva Goswami continues, so they've approached the Lord, uh, Lord Shiva that is, begging for help to save them from the danger of this poison. The whole world right now is flooded with poison, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Everywhere, poisonous philosophy, poisonous behavior, literal poison everywhere and the effects of that you know poisonous everything practically consciousness poisoned and so many poisonous activities going on 
everywhere throughout the whole world. I don't think you can find an exception to that other than where pure devotional service is being found, but that's very rare. Lord Shiva is always benevolent towards all living entities. It's the nature of Vaishnava, isn't it? They're always thinking the welfare of others. When he saw that the living entities were very much disturbed by the poison, because it wasn't really just the demigods and demons who were churning, the whole universe was threatened, which was spreading everywhere. He was very compassionate. Just look nowadays, how much poison is spreading everywhere. We have, I mean, Kali has, has allowed the introduction of various um, rapid forms of disseminating, could disseminate nectar too. But mostly it's being used because the predominant personalities on this planet are demoniac. Um, so poison is being spread in every direction. Practically speaking, the devotees try to counter it with some transcendental subjects, but it's overwhelming. And even they, it's like Sri Ramaswamy's Facebook page, Facebook just wiped him off of Facebook because he was, you know, too outspoken about the truth. You know, so they just cancel you out. They don't like you use those. Um, you know, because they, their whole policy, their whole program is to spread poison. But the whole universe is being you know, threatened by this um, manifestation of terrible, strong poisons. We're in the same boat today. Uh, thus he spoke to his eternal consort, Sati, as follows, Parvati. Though she was said, my dear, my dear Bhavani, just see how all these living entities have been placed in danger because of the poison produced from the churning of the ocean of milk. It is my duty to give protection and safety to all living entities struggling for existence. Certainly, it is the duty of the master to protect the suffering dependents. People in general, being bewildered by the illusory energy, the illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are always engaged in animosity toward one another. You don't have to follow up on that, it, it speaks for itself. But devotees, even at the risk of their own temporary lives, even at the risk of their own temporary lives, try to save them. Notice the word temporary. It's probably to use this word temporary here. Um, because it's the body, the soul never dies, so we give up our lives in one sense. It's everyone has to give up their life if we sleep with the body, or we have to give up the body. We have no choice. It's material. It's nature is like that. Um, this is the characteristic, Prabhupada says, of a Vaishnava. What is the characteristic of a Vaishnava? Sorry? Compassionate. Compassionate, okay. You could say a lot of things, don't you? Benevolent. Okay, benevolent, very good. Similar. What else? Taking care of the dependents. Just getting a break to drink my tea. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> oh, I like the honey in the bottom, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we get to? Merciful. Huh? Merciful. What do you think? Merciful. Merciful. Okay, they're all kind of similar, really. What else? Submissive. Pardon? Submissive. Submissive. Mm, yeah, it's not exclusive, or it depends how you define it, of course. Submissive indeed, submissive to the right thing, not just submissive to my or submissive to the poison. Truthful. Truthful, yeah. Let's stick to the subject matter here, where Prabhupada is saying that uh, Lord Shiva, well not Prabhupada is saying, but Bhagavatam here, being described here how merciful Lord Shiva is. So Lord Shiva is speaking here, that his duty is to save the living entities because he's seeing that they're suffering, right? 
There was a famous little catch, a little statement, a little few words in Sanskrit, the mind of a devotee. The devotee doesn't suffer on their own account. Well, but they appear to sometimes suffer. What is that? Paradukha Dukhi. Because of the suffering of others, they feel pain. All that what you said is correct, merciful, compassionate, benevolent, this thing, that thing. Equal to all. It's true, but then this little statement. The Vaishnava is always unhappy. If you leave it at that. Then. <laughs> Justification for your present state of mind. <laughs> the Bible says in the back of the time, we always have to be unhappy. And sometimes the girls quote things like this, you know. I mean, they don't quote half a sentence, but they quote a sentence within a big context of a big subject matter, and they take that as an absolute statement in of itself, but it's got to be understood in a particular context, otherwise it can have the wrong result. So, Vaishnava is always unhappy. Otherwise, he would have no business. <laughs> You've got to finish the sentence, right? <coughs> Vaishnava is always unhappy to see the conditioned souls unhappy. And even if the conditioned souls appear happy, he, he, he can see it. Vaishnava can see well, what they're doing now is going to cause unhappiness in the future. Otherwise, he would have no business teaching them how to become happy. In materialistic life, people must certainly engage in activities of animosity. Animosity, I guess it's similar to animal, really, isn't it? it? probably comes from the same root, this kind of... Not really having consideration for the other party. You see the other party as an object of my sense gratification. And that constantly creates animosity. Materialistic life is therefore compared to... And the Gurvastikam prayers? What's the first words? Samsaradava Nalalita Loka Tanaya Karna Gunaganatam What is that? Blazing fire. He's considered a blazing fire because he's got the book right in front of his nose, as always. And <laughs> always eager to share the nectar. Um, but let's go a little further. The material world is considered here it's in, as a dhavana, as a blazing fire. What does a person death, a repeated person cycle of person death, like a blazing fire? And wants to rest somebody else, please? What's the rest of the verse? You sing most days if you sing Gurvastika. Sometimes we sing songs, we haven't got a clue what they mean. Maybe we sing, wake up sleeping souls or something. Every morning we sing the wake up song from Saradava. There's a bit more to it than that. What does it mean, first verse? Don't be so humble, you can look at me, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're shy. I know you were shy. Sorry, mind, I don't know it. Oh, then read it. Yeah. <laughs> Just as a cloud falls water on a forest fire to extinguish it, the question might suggest the materially affected world by extinguishing the blazing fire of material existence. Mm -hmm. The business of the Vaishnava. But at least assist, even if we've still got a bit of blazing fire within us, which we may have. Most likely we have. Um, we're still you know, affected by lust, which is also like a good blazing fire. Or greed, or anger, or envy, madness, delusion, etc. Um, but yes, the, the spiritual master's only business. God's not really only business. His business is to wake and love of God. But his business at this stage, I mean, the purpose of life is not just to Extinguish the blazing fire of material existence. It's not just to remove the poison, but it's to churn and get the nectar. For both of them. But first, you have to get rid of the poison. You won't be able to taste the nectar as long as it's mixed with poison. So, Lord Shiva plays an important role here. The spiritual master plays this role to um, extinguish that blazing fire. How could you be happy in a blazing fire? Unless you're transcendental. Um, 
um, a blazing fire, forest fire, it automatically take place. Lord Shiva and his followers in the Parampara system try to save people from this dangerous condition of material life. This is the duty of devotees following the principles of Lord Shiva and belonging to the root of Sampradaya. There are four Sampradayas, a Vaishnava ones, and the root of Sampradaya is one of them. Because Lord Shiva is the best of the Vaishnavas. Indeed, as we shall see, Lord Shiva drank all the poison for the benefit of humanity. They take on this sinful. We see with Jesus Christ, Haridatha Kaur, Vasudev Dutta, Harshim Prabhupada, so many. Pure devotees of the Lord make that basically their program to relieve all of the entities of their karmic sinful reactions and deliver them from this ocean of birth and death. Not just the reactions, but in terms of direct reaction, but indirect, in the sense of their tendencies to commit sinful activity. It's one thing to relieve them of the reactions to that. It's another thing to release them from activities which cause sinful reactions. My dear gentle wife, Bhavani, when one performs benevolent activities for others, the Supreme Personality of God at Hari is very pleased. Even materially speaking, to it may be a very, very beginning stage in whatever mode it's in, but something is there. Some beginning of giving, some beginning of putting one's own interest aside for that of others, even if it's in ignorance. And when the Lord is pleased, I am also pleased, along with all other living creatures. So here we see, although the demigods have approached him and praised him as, you know, you are the supreme, you are the controller, you are the creator, you are everything. Here Lord Shiva himself says, When the Lord is pleased, I am also pleased. Therefore let me drink this poison, for all the living entities may thus become happy because of me. <coughs> um, so he's willing to take that on his own shoulders, as great devotees do, take on that reaction, take on that poisonous reaction. Very good to court. Sri Shukadeva Goswami continued, after informing Bhavani in this way, Lord Shiva began to drink the poison. And Bhavani, who knew perfectly well the capabilities of Lord Shiva, gave him her permission to do so. Normally would do that. Basically, you're taking death. Thereafter, Lord Shiva, who was dedicated to auspicious, benevolent work, for humanity compassionately took the whole quantity of poison in his palm and drank it. He was able to do that, whether in one go or coming in, but he drank it all. Although there was such a great quantity of poison that it spread all over the universe, Lord Shiva, although there was a great quantity, so great it was spread all over the universe by now, Lord Shiva had such great power that he reduced the poison to a small quantity so that he could hold it in his palm. One should not try to imitate Lord Shiva. Prabhupada uses this example of Allah. Lord Shiva can do whatever he likes. But those who try to imitate Lord Shiva by drinking tea... No. Uh, <laughs> by what? Smoking ganja, <laughs> could be any other kind of toxic, we say intoxication, it's toxic, poison is toxic, any other kind of toxic by smoking ganja, or any other kind of toxic of course, and Umpa says here, and other poisonous things will certainly be killed because of such activities. We can't imitate or she will never imitate these powerful personalities. As if in defamation, the poison born from the ocean of milk manifests its potency. How did it manifest its potency after being drunk by the ocean? His throat turned blue. His throat turned blue. And he's known as the famous name of Lord Shiva. Nilakanta. Beautiful name, Nilakanta. By marking Lord Shiva's neck with a bluish line. That line, however, is now accepted as an ornament of the Lord. It's not that, oh my God, that, that, that's poison in my throat down here. Mm. Holding on to it. To make sure it doesn't get out. No, but it's become an ornament. 
one of the glorifying Lord Shiva for his magnanimous benevolent act. And now we're going to read a verse which is very significant. Text 44. Tapyanti lokata pena sadava praya sojanaha paramaradanam thaddi purushas yagilatmanaha. Anyone know this verse without looking at the book? There's two or three of you tuned in on your mobiles. And on the latest side, it looks like even more of them are tuned in. And maybe they're all tuned in now. They're very well equipped. Very well equipped. So, uh, and it seems like the majority of you have access to this now. So I'll read it. It is said, though she was speaking, it is said that great personalities almost always accept voluntary suffering because of the suffering of people in general. This is considered the highest method of worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is present in everyone's heart. Now this is a very, for those devotees who are trying to spread Krishna consciousness in whatever means, this verse is a very important verse. Very important. Here's an explanation of how those engaged in activities for the welfare of others are very quickly recognized by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Probably use the example that those on the front lines in the battle are given the, you know, the medals, the reward. They're recognized by the government, at least they should be. Of course, the government themselves should be on the front line, but they don't in this day and age. But anyway, they give them the recognition that they're heroes. They're on the front line, they're taking a big risk, they could die at any moment. They have to face challenges day and night, and many of you know that. It's not a joke, I mean, in that sense, as far as their situation goes, it's a reality. They're faced with death at every moment, of day and night, even just day, day and night. I know when my father was in the Second World War, he didn't sleep for weeks on end, he was on the front line. Weeks on end he didn't sleep. Couldn't sleep. The only time he said he slept was when he was walking. They had no time. They were 24 7 alert. You know, it's, I mean, in one sense, devotion services, we don't, of course, have that same, because exactly, but it's similar in some ways. 24 7 alert. Maya may catch us at any moment. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Ya idam paramam guyam mabhateshvabhidashiti. There's no no, there's no no. There's no no. That the one who 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 passes the message the message of yeah, Bhagavad Gita. Dear. One who teaches his message. He says to the devotees, but you know, every living entity um, is by constitution is a devotee, so the devotee wants to, and Krishna doesn't really want his devotees to be disturbed by the non-devotees, but the non-devotees, the devotees want to bring non-devotees to devotional service, to Krishna's pleasure, so they see them like that. The devotees see that others are worthy, and the Chaitas man, Manashri Shukasya may appear quickly, there will never be one more dear to him, me than he, no, you know, there's no one more dear, there never will be one more dear. One who preaches Krishna consciousness in this world, is the most dear to Krishna. It's extinguishing the blazing fire, extinguishing, taking up that poison, removing the poison from the world. There are different kinds. My devotee is most dear to me. No one can excel him in satisfying me by worshipping, worships the Lord by preaching. There are different kinds of welfare activity in this world, but the supreme welfare activity is the spreading of Krishna consciousness. Other welfare activities might be to, you know, protect you a little bit from the poison, or maybe even to give you more poison. But they don't really remove the poison. Other welfare activities can, cannot be effective for the laws of nature, or the laws of karma, rather. Laws of nature and the results of karma cannot be checked. It is by destiny or the laws of karma that one can that one must suffer or enjoy. For instance, if one is given a court order, he must accept it, whether it brings suffering or profit. Similarly, everyone is under obligations of, to karma and its reactions. No one can change this, therefore the Sastras say, 
Tashiva hito prayate to kovido, labyate yat amadam pariyada. From the first, fifth, can, fifth chapter of the first canto. Um, one should endeavor for that which is never obtained by wandering up and down the universe as a result of the reactions of karma. What is that? One should endeavor to become Krishna conscious. If one tries to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world, one should be understood to be performing the best welfare activity. The Lord is automatically very pleased with him. If the Lord is pleased with him, what is left for him to achieve? If one has been recognized by the Lord, even if he does not ask the Lord for anything, the Lord who is within everyone supplies him whatever he wants. Krishna assures us in the Bhagavad Gita and Yaschintiyantamangyajana Paripasati. This is also confirmed. Desham nitya yuktanam yoga kshema laham yam in Bhagavad Gita. Because it preserves what we have, provides what we lack. Again, as stated here, tapyante loka tapena sadhava praya sojanaha. The best welfare activity is raising people to the platform of Krishna consciousness, since the conditioned souls are suffering only for want of Krishna consciousness. The Lord himself also comes to mitigate the suffering of humanity. Also in the Bhagavad Gita, famous verses, 4th chapter, text 7 and 8. What are they? Please be quiet. <laughs> we have to have a permanent, a permanent uh, guard there. <laughs> but your enthusiasm is wonderful. Anyone else? 4, 7, 8. 4th chapter, text 7 and 8. You got it. You got it. Bother. Where's Krishna Loka? She's uh, coming back from Vrindavan today. Coming back from Vrindavan today. Is that right? You've been in India. Huh? Oh, that'd be nice. Good. Good. So yes, in the fourth chapter, text seven and eight. Sounds good, please. Well, most things. <laughs> translation. <laughs> Perhaps that's one of the most famous, especially Adayada. Almost, almost every Indian person knows that, don't they? <laughs> Even if they don't believe a word of the Bible, they don't know that verse. I appear. They may take it. I appear in every millennium in my transcendental form. What does it mean? Whenever we're in the nursery, there's a decline in practice. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Finish? That's the end of the verse. Whenever we're in the nursery, there's a decline in practice. Yeah, decline in Decline in religious principles of life of irreligion at that time I descend myself. Whenever and wherever there's a decline, oh, descend the bar and a predominant rise of irreligion. At that time I descend myself to deliver the pious and annihilate the miscreants, as well as to establish, re-establish, not establish, re-establish the principles of religion. I invent myself millennium after millennium to establish, to remove the poison and those who are spreading the poison, demons. Krishna Consciousness, all the Shastras conclude therefore that spreading Krishna Consciousness movement is the best welfare activity in the world. Because of the ultimate benefit this bestows upon people in general, the Lord very quickly recognizes such service performed by a devotee. I'll just finish the chapter, I two verses left. Upon hearing of this act, everyone, including Bhavani, the daughter of Maharaj Dakshin, Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu, and the people in general, very highly praised this deed performed by Lord Shiva, who is worshipped by the demigods, and who bestows benediction upon the people. Don't forget, not that we're doing it for that, but the fact is that any devotee who is taking on, on their shoulders on behalf um, of Sri Prabhupada, this opportunity to distribute books, to chant the holy name in public, public whatever it is, ways of preaching on the internet, anything, whatever, trying to spread this message of Krishna consciousness to others, is very, very dear to the Lord and worshipped by the demigods. 
these ones assisting a pure devotee in this mission of removing the poison and spreading the mercy of nectar and devotional service everywhere. The most magnanimous act to the tongue be tongue to the Jeevan and Kavi Bhirid some Kalma Shapa the famous verse found in the um, Gopi Gita book of the Gopis Radharani in separation glorifying those who are spreading only messages related to spoken by or related to the personality of Godhead to Krishna can relieve the distress of the conditioned souls, those suffering in this particular world. And those persons who are spreading this message should be spread all widely all over the world. And those who are taking this on board, spreading are the greatest, the most wonderful Bhuritya, Dhanajanaha. Of all people, they are the greatest welfare workers. Scorpions, last verse of the chapter. Scorpions, cobras, poisonous drugs, and other animals whose bites are poisonous, took the opportunity to drink whatever little poison had fallen and scattered from Lord Shiva's hand while he was drinking. Hmm. Yeah, that's just a conclusion of, of this particular past time. Okay, well, we'll finish there. Any questions? Two hands, three hands. Four hands. Okay, one of those two are the first, and you're next. You're next. Okay. They're brothers, so don't fight. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> of course you do. Um, Marge, uh, thank you for the class. Just uh, so this, this a question regarding when I mentioned about how the Shiva is the protector of the dam. Protect of the dam. The protect of the dam. Mm. So I was just wondering, uh, like, do we know why, like, the Mughals were able to attack Vrindavan and destroy some of the temples and, you know, the holy place? He wasn't doing his job, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he dozed off for, for a few minutes. <laughs> Meant for a tea break. Huh? <laughs> for a tea break, exactly. <laughs> Maybe he took too much ganja or something. <laughs> What's the reason? Yeah, okay, a good, good point you could say. Um, similar, you could say, to the train of thought we had last night. I said, what is the Dharma? And, uh, you know, what it means. It's like in our own lives, you know. Most people think of protection being a physical protection. Maybe not. Why isn't God pro pro protecting me? You know, I lost my job, I lost my house, I lost my this and that. And neophyte stage, most people think that that's what it means. God is a provider, he's given me a good job, I've got a nice husband, wife, a nice house. God and Krishna is so kind to me. Then when you lose it, you know, you may think slightly differently. Huh? Sometimes you lose your faith, many people do, shallow faith. So even in our own lives we have that, uh, this, this uh, um, mentality, we don't really realize what it means to be protected by the Lord. I was, one time in a studio, a television studio, anyway, it's a long story story, it was a challenge show with some atheists challenging religion, and there was one Christian lady in a wheelchair, she had terminal cancer, they, I think they set it up actually, but they brought her on, and they challenged her, that, you know, look at what is your God doing to you? He said, you're protecting, you're dying of terminal cancer. You know, you can come to us, we might be able to help you, but your God doesn't seem to be doing much for you. You're dying. He said, no, he's protecting you. Said, how is he protecting you? What do you mean he's protecting you? Of course, they have no idea who you is, and they have no idea who, what the dam is. The dam is not bricks and stones. It's not, you know, it's not even, even temples. They're not in, in the sense they are, in the sense they're not. The human is not, the human river, for instance, is not sewage coming out of the factories in Delhi. That's what we may see, but that's not actually what's there. Um, it's beyond that, that they can't access, they can't get, it's like they go to the moon, they think they know what the moon is. They've never been to the moon. I mean, physically they may have gone to some planet, but they've never entered the moon. And you can't just walk in the Dharma and say, this is the Dharma, and this is the temple, and this is the deity, and this is that. And we can, in a sense, it reminds us of Krishna. 
if, and if you're a positive heart, then the Lord will reciprocate. If you don't have a positive heart, it will draw himself. He's not there. So the real protection is what? So this lady, she said, my Lord is Jesus is protecting me. What do you mean by that? They couldn't work it out. She said, I have no fear. No fear. Whatever's happened to my body, I have, I have no fear. I fear, I have nothing. She was definitely on a, a somewhat advanced spiritual platform. Christian lady. We've seen this quite a few times. I remember when I was in Penang Airport a few day or two after the tsunami in Indonesia. I was there. And there was one um, Muslim man who was going back to his home in Bandar Aceh where the biggest um, devastation took place, I think. 150,000 people died in the city um, in a few minutes. So he didn't even know if his family was alive. He had no idea. He was going to go fly to Medan and then try to make his way over land to Bandar Aceh. There was nothing. He couldn't fly in there. So um, anyway, I asked him what he thought of what he was going to say. He just said, what can we say? Everything is in the hands of God. Whatever happens is good. Whatever happens is his will. We just accept it like that. I don't know how much we think like that, but he was thinking like that. But I thought he was very impressed. This man's got some realization. The Muslim. Um, well, back to the Holy Dharm, say in, in, in India, when waves of destruction took place at various temples, and maybe even individuals were killed, etc. Uh, for whatever reason, these things go on. So what is the protection there? Why isn't Lord Shiva playing his part there? Uh, he withdraws the dam. You won't see it. They may be destroying the externals, because they think God isn't, the Hindu God is simply a statue. So they break a statue, but that's not breaking Krishna. They break the temple, but they're not really breaking the temple. It only appears like that. They have no idea what the real temple is. We can't see the dawn. It's not seen by mundane eyes. The construction of all buildings are going to crumble anyway eventually. It's a fact. No matter what they are. Even, even the manifestation of the Lord in the daily form, the Lord is always there, but the, what we see may not always be there. It's like in Christchurch. The deities were destroyed in the earthquake. Does that mean Krishna is dead? No. Krishna has another plan. Ironically, as you may remember, I'm not sure, but that morning, um, Kurnika was giving Bhagavatam class. I think it's a verse in the fourth canto. I can't remember what it says exactly. But it was regarding uh, sometimes the Lord, when he sees his temple is, is getting old, and not, he, he may arrange for a new one. When he sees his garden is you know, in disarray, he makes a new arrangement. We don't know what the Lord's plans are. And Lord she is acting to fulfill the Lord's plans. Did you know that the night before, the head Bajara's daughter had a, a dream? Gorni Tai were leaving the altar. We're leaving now. Oh, we're going on Sankata. She went out of the temple. She dreamt it the night before that. No chance. We can't see. We all have a plan. Nothing happens to chance. Different arrangements are there. We can't always analyze the, the external details, but we know for sure that Lord Shiva is acting according to the will of the Lord and according to his plan. Not like what was he doing when the Muslims attacked. And many other factors. You could speculate on or go on and on, but for sure that much we can understand. It's not happening by chance. It's not because of their power. They're not destroying the dawn. Uh, Krishna has you know, just given them a reflection of the dawn and perverting and that they may okay destroy that, but the dawn remains. It remains undisturbed in that sense. Sometimes manifest, sometimes unknown. Choice of the Lord. And same with our devotional service, you know, it's 
not a question of external achievement, there's an internal change of consciousness. And the Dharma is really, in one sense, it's just it's revealed according to our consciousness, not according to our mundane vision or senses, state of consciousness. And just to help us to develop that state of consciousness, the Lord and the Dharma may manifest in various ways try to attract us to the real dawn. So as long as there was some material motivation when Jagdhan Prabhupada went to Vrindavan, his first disciple, Kitnanandan, who then took Swat Sanya in 1967 in Vrindavan. Kitnanandan was just a fresher to Christian consciousness. He was looking at Vrindavan, why is it so broken and broken? Because the material it looked broken and dirty. Maybe a little better now, but then it was most of the buildings were broken. There was no money at all, practically. I had not many people coming. Why it looks so broken and dirty, brother said, that's because your house is broken and dirty. You'll see him broken and dirty. Krishna's reciprocating. So he reciprocates with everyone accordingly. That's not the real down. It's a reflection. Like you go to Radakun, you can't really bathe in Radakun. If your consciousness is good, it's purifying. But Radakun is not just a lake, not just a body of water. Radakun is the you know, liquid manifestation of Radharani is praying. You can't just jump in there, here I am. Context, you know, it's like when you grow up as a child, who's the best man in the world? Your dad. Your dad, but he may always remain in a sense, but you realize later on, you know, he's the best in one sense, but not the best in every sense. He may not be the best musician on the planet, you know. Then you realize later on, someone else is the best musician, someone else is the best politician, someone else is the best footballer, whatever it is. So in the context particularly of this material universe where almost everyone is materialistic, Lord Shiva is the best because it helped you in that sense, you could say. They all approach him. They see him as the best. But he's actually a Vaishnava. He's amazing. Showing us he's in the mode of Tamagun, how he's still serving the Lord. But he's the best in that sense. But not in every sense. According to the particular Situation, he's, he's the best in, that, in the material universe. But the pure devotees who come into the universe, of course, they're not in the universe, they're transcendental. To it. So when you go beyond the material universe, you see a different picture. Anything else? Yes. Thank you, Pastor Um I was wondering, you were speaking about how, like in this past time, when we're turning our heart to chanting Hare Krishna, a lot of things come up. I was wondering um, when you see like the poison you know, that we do not um, get the motivation to keep going and know that eventually that will go away. Well, if you keep chanting Hare Krishna and you, you, know, you follow the process, yes. Um, that's the process of Krishna consciousness, the Chaitanya Dhapa and Marjan. So, naturally, it will cleanse the heart of the it's called, if you read Nectar Devotion, you'll see the characteristics of pure devotional service. The first characteristic is the Kleshagni, Shubhada Kleshagni. These are the first, these two characteristics are there in 
even in the beginning stages of sadhana, um, in the Vajrana Kriya stage, we may not be completely purified, but these two go on, awaking auspiciousness or devotional practice, through devotional practices and removal of inauspicious or um, unwanted things, they get burned up in the heart. Dirty desires, etc. So yes, you should carry on. But you carry on and they have to have a little common sense that if the, if the material fire is getting greater or if your attachment to it, let's say, is starting to develop, then we have to be very careful. At that point we have to inquire or we have to um, realize that we have to make some adjustment here. It may be, maybe whatever it may be, it may be a, both external and internal, but some kind of adjust, adjustment sometimes have to be made. When we see there's a reawakening of, of, let's say, our material inclinations to try to enjoy this blazing fire, and we have to be on guard and be aware. So cry out, we have to beg the Lord for mercy, beg the devotees for shelter, guidance, what to do. You don't just blindly carry on with mechanical chanting because there's a danger in our present state is our chanting is not so pure, not so serious, it's sometimes totally mechanical. We just want to get the numbers finished and move on with whatever else we have to do. We're not actually associating or making a serious effort to associate with Krishna. Or we may be harboring offensive feelings towards others pride, all various enemies, are, we're still accommodating these enemies, we're, we're not uh, repentant of that, we're still, we, we may be proud of the fact we, we think the way we do, etc. We do have to be careful to watch out for the, and say the obstacles on the path of devotional service and take the necessary steps to um, you know, not become a victim of those enemies. And when you chant Hare Krishna, even mechanically, uh, you know, there, there, sometimes these effects will come. When you chant purely, they're going to come up for sure. And you'll carry on chanting purely and they'll, get, they'll go away. But when our chanting is not serious, when it's offensive, then definitely you're not going to be cleared of these uh, enemies within the heart. So we have to try to cultivate uh, offenseless chanting of the holy name and pray for mercy without mercy we have no hope to pray for it if you're sincere we'll recognize this we won't be proud and try to hide it object when somehow another lord points it out somewhere or another rather we fight against it and we said oh that's my name that's my nature nothing wrong with that no, we need to change. We want nature which is pleasing to Krishna. So, so we have to be a little conscious. Anything else? Last one. Uh, thank you for the class. Uh, in, in verse 38, I just quote the translation, there is no purport here. Lord Shiva says, It is my duty to give protection and safety to all living entities struggling for existence. Certainly, it is the duty of the master to protect his suffering dependents. And we know Vaishnam Yatha Shambhu. So, there is somebody above Lord Shiva. We can ask Shiva for bhakti, but there is definitely someone above him. So, why does Lord Shiva say, it is my duty to give protection, when it is Lord who is giving protection? Wow. I have to rewrite the verse, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if Lord Shiva, I, I think he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Certainly more than I do, that's for sure. Well, what do you think? We could say that about everything, couldn't we? Well, you know, why doesn't Krishna spread the Sankatam River? Why didn't he do everything? We read that in a few verses earlier. How Lord, how Lord Vishnu loves to give the praise to his devotees. 
He loves to give them the opportunity. Prabhupada said, Bhakti Vinod Sarkar could have spread Krishna consciousness alone all over the world, but he gave us the privilege. He gave us the privilege. Now this is something beyond what we see externally. We always try to measure things externally. And try to, you know, analyze, measure. We can't, we can't always see what's going on. The loving reciprocation between the Lord and his devotees, like Lord Shiva. You can't see it. His duty, it's like a devotee's duty. It's like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, don't disturb them, even though their activities are inferior by nature. He recommends don't disturb but the devotee does disturb them. He goes out of his way to try to preach Krishna consciousness, even though they don't want it. Tell them to get out of here, get lost, get a job. <laughs> huh? Be off. Huh? But the devotee knows the will of the Lord. Acting on the will of the Lord, we have no power. Prabhupada never took credit for spreading Krishna consciousness. It was the mercy of his Guru and Krishna. We're acting on behalf of. So we're acting on behalf of the Master, and we call the spiritual Master. It's a spiritual master's duty to relieve the suffering of those who are followers. And Lord Shiva being the position he is, he's not just a spiritual master of a few, he's responsible for the whole universe. So it's his duty to act for the welfare of the whole universe, whatever that may be. In this case, it's to remove the poison from the ocean. We have the same duty as their responsibility. Lord Chaitanya has ordered everyone in the universe to do it. Not everyone's going to do it, but he's ordered that order. In other words, everyone can do it. We can all act in that role um, of taking the responsibility of the master, or the word the servant, to uh, protect other living entities from Maya, from illusion, from the blazing fire, forest fire. It's their duty. It's the master's duty to protect the dependents. Ultimately, yes, you can say it's Krishna, but we're acting on his behalf. Okay, we'll finish there. Shri Prabhupada Kija, Gaur Prem Anandi.